Hello, I'm Eric Ryan, and I'm a concept artist at Sony Santa Monica. Uh, today I'm going to be taking you through the steps of how to create a character for games and film. I'll be going through um, all the character ideation steps and lighting, rendering, and um, color, uh, all the way to a final render. So. Um, try to make it as entertaining as possible because I know how boring these things can get. So sit back, relax, and uh, I'll begin the show now. <clears throat> All right. So basically I'm starting with a, um, contour line drawing of a pose that I had thought of. Um, what I had done is I um, took a picture of myself and I'm drawing based uh, on the photo of that picture. I'm sorry, on the photo of that pose. And I'm trying to figure out um, if, this, if this pose is going to translate well uh, for this particular character. So <clears throat> I guess what's going on in my mind is that I'm um, trying to create a cool dynamic action pose for this character and something that kind of speaks to what this character is all about. Um, I think in the back of my mind, I'm trying to make a character that's, at this point, I'm trying to make a character that is, uh, you know, a brute um, he meets like the brute archetype and the brute archetype is, um, something big, brawny, um, savage. Uh, it, you know, if anything gets in its way, it's just going to plow right through it. Um, so lots of heft, lots of muscle. Um, and I'm trying to, uh, figure out what a good pose for that is. <clears throat> Here I am. I think I just tossed that old pose and uh, trying to uh, figure out what this boar is going to look like. Maybe maybe start with his head this time around. Uh, maybe that'll inspire me. Um, looks like I'm kind of going back to my old pose and seeing if I can develop it from a slightly different angle. Uh, in terms of how I draw it, not necessarily the pose. Um, you can see there I use the lasso tool a lot to um, try to move parts and pieces around just to get the anatomy and, and the positioning correct. Um, it also might help me figure out a little quicker if this pose is even going to work for the, the type of anatomy this thing has. <clears throat> um, because when I posed for it, I obviously have a th kind of a thinner body and this thing is going to be really hefty and hunky. Um, and this pose might hide too much. It, it might not work that well for something that's beefy. Um, so uh, I kind of go through a few iterations. Um, one thing to note is that this is not my usual process. Um, usually in character development, you are, um, drawing thumbnails, you're drawing head studies, weapon studies, all this stuff before you even get to a rendered stage. So I'm kind of skipping along for the sake of this demo because demos are usually more interesting when you take something from nothing to final instead of doing all the little side iterations. So I'm kind of just plowing forward with this idea I have in my head, this preconceived idea I have in my head and trying to kind of, um, make it real, make it into a final concept. And that's not always easy to do. If I had a, you know, a drawing in front of me that or, or several drawings in front of me that had already kind of developed this thing and already know what it is very, very concretely, I wouldn't be, um, probably noodling around with this as much. I'd, I'd try to 
knock it out um, pretty quickly, know what the pose is, know all that stuff before um, I uh, start drawing uh, the final piece. <clears throat> so here, still kind of struggling, still trying to figure it out. Um, I mean, you know, part of the reason why I say I'm struggling is because I know in my head at this stage I'm just not happy with it. I'm not, I'm not, you know, giving him weapons. I'm not giving him any kind of armor or anything. I'm still in the, you know, the body stage of it, and I know that that's just because I'm in the body stage. I know that uh, I'm not in a good place yet with it. I haven't. I want to commit to it too much. Um, when I say body stage, it just means you know, I'm just drawing the body and not adding new things to it. I'm just trying to figure out what what's a good setup for it. Um, part of the reason why I don't like this pose um, is because number one, the face right now you can see it's like uh, it's half of the face is hidden. Um, one of the legs is almost completely hidden, um, and that would be okay if this was like an illustration, like a, you know, a really dynamic illustration where maybe multiple things were happening and, and the pose had to be, um, you know, maybe foreshortened or parts of it, you know, the arm, one arm maybe wasn't um, as visible. Um, the issue with character concept is this, is that you wait, if you're going to do an illustration that's super dynamic, you can't really consider that a concept. Um, you, you have to give a concept, a concept is something that needs to be understood by animators, by 3D modelers, um, all these people after you in the production line. Um, and so they need to be able to see, you know, you know, I would say at least 75% of its body. You know, you, can, you might be able to heart, uh, hide a leg or an arm, um, but you really need to show off most of its body. And any kind of foreshortening or any kind of uh, shading that gets things too dark, um, you're gonna you're gonna you know lose information in that area. And then a 3D modeler or a uh, animator is gonna come to you and be like, well, what what is that? How does that move? What does that do? So for a concept, you really want to reveal as much of it as possible and save those other things for, you know, uh, key con or key art, which is, you know, basically production illustration where you got maybe multiple characters, characters in a scene or you have that character in a very dynamic pose. Uh, for example, maybe on a magazine cover. So um, it's almost a separate illustration and I would treat it as so. Um, also, you know, this pose, for example, you know, even if you do kind of show most of the character in, in the one pose or in one um, illustration, uh, you still are going to probably have to do turnarounds for it for the modeler because they're going to need to see what the back looks like. They're going to need to know what the side of the face looks like. They're going to need to know what pieces of armor look like. Um, uh, what the weapon looks like uh, front side back, you know, like so you're gonna you're gonna be uh, doing many uh, drawings of the same thing, so I'll get used to that. <clears throat> Here I am of uh, toss the other head. Um, and I kind of made the head more visible, obviously. Uh, which is something that I uh, was talking about. Um, I think he's addressing the viewer too, so that helps to engage um, you know, whoever's looking at the image a little bit more. It kind of sells it. Um, selling is a big thing because you have to, you know, basically selling is just getting people on board with your idea. And that's going to be something you have to do all the time because you have to basically sell your image to your art director, the person above you. So you want to really engage them um, in, any, in as many ways poss as, as possible. Um, so.
So here, um, you can see I'm adding darker tones to the face. Um, darker tones, obviously, in this stage, mean that I'm, I'm kind of getting more comfortable with that section, um, committing a little bit more to it. Um, the upper body, uh, I'm kind of liking. Um, the pose feels like he's he's dancing, and it doesn't really feel strong. Um, uh, I'm trying to do this thing, I guess in my head I'm trying to make him look like there's some anticipation or that somebody, you know, called his attention and now he's twisting around. But I think the pose, unfortunately, is too weak. He doesn't feel very grounded and solid. He feels a little, um, a little off balance. So I, I think that draws away from the idea that he's supposed to be very powerful and um, heavy being. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, liking the leg anatomy. Um, you know, um, really, I think the um, upper torso is definitely working. Just got to figure out, excuse me, how to make him, you know, beefier. Um, part of what I should, uh, I guess I should mention is that I'm looking at reference constantly. So on one screen, I'm actually drawing. The other screen, um, I'm looking at reference. Um, I use all kinds of reference. I use, you know, for his face, I'm using warthog reference. Um, but I'm, you know, I use all sorts of reference. Like if I like, uh, for example, the fabric on somebody's shirt or the, um, texture of leather on, on animal skin or, um, or on our, you know, on a, a live rhinoceros or something like that. Like I use any kind of reference that I think will be valuable to me um, for this particular guy. I mean, I'll even use maybe a, like uh, the blue skin color on a fish. Um, I'll use that and say, hey, I want to use that blue. That's a nice blue that maybe I'll implement somewhere in this, uh, this scene for this character. So um, don't be afraid to just find any sort of reference. Don't limit yourself to, um, you know, for example, in this case, don't just limit yourself to a warthog, you know, go, go all out. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, that'll help inspire you to, um, um, find other things. Maybe there's something you find accidentally on Google or, or any kind of search engine. And maybe you'll see an image of, uh, an, a, a different type of warthog or a different, um, type of, uh, leather or something that'll help you, um, take this thing further. Um, so yeah, um, so here are kind of, uh, um, was messing around with this other pose. It's a little bit of a stronger pose, um, but he, it's still kind of like he's skipping or something. And the idea here was that he's, he's kind of turning and like, he's kind of like turning in a run or skidding. And um, he's about to, you know, wreak havoc on whoever drew his attention. Um, I think it just, wasn't working that well, so I, I later on I end up trashing it. I'm sorry that I spent a lot of time talking about poses, but um, I think it's because I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And if you don't have a solid idea for a pose, you end up doing what I'm doing right here, which is struggling. Um, Yeah, you'll see like I'm copying pasting parts. I'm like lassoing parts on, moving them around. 
and I know I'd mentioned this before, but um, just trying to uh, reposition things, see if things work quickly, um, as opposed to redrawing them uh, just for that one little uh, position change. Um, and uh, I want to figure that out sooner than later because if I don't like the new pose after I reposition things and I can feel like I didn't commit too much to it, I had too much time. Um, I guess a few things I should mention um, in terms of being a concept artist and the, um, you know, some of my theories behind that is that, um, you know, expect to do lots of drawings um, and lots of drawings of the same thing. Um, it gives you a lot of mileage, but it's also kind of necessary because you're developing a character. It's my my uh, field, or I guess my department is called the Visual Development Department. Department, and it's um, you're literally developing something, almost as if you're giving birth to it. So there's a lot of steps, a lot of iterations, a lot of time put into one character. Even though this concept took me, you know, two or three days to do, uh, you know, total, um, you know, w at work we can spend, you know, a couple months or more figuring out what one character looks like. Um, and, you know, that has to do with the approval process, but also has to do with, you know, people aren't really sure, you know, what they want in the game yet, um, which is a good and bad thing. So you just kind of got to roll with those punches and, and know that uh, you're going to have to draw something, you know, a lot and get in um, many different variations and iterations of it. <clears throat> um, something I always tell my uh, students or people that uh, have taken my workshops um, is that um, you know, the difference between a concept artist and an illustrator is, from what I've heard from uh, my past teachers, is is that uh, a concept artist um, isn't afraid to draw something ugly, um, isn't afraid to make a bad drawing. I think is how they put that. Um, and an illustrator commits basically. An illustrator basically commits to their drawing sooner than a concept artist does. And that's just the nature of the beast. A concept artist is an idea artist. So, you know, it's more about how good the idea is than um, how, how well the drawing is done. Um, you can always spend time later uh, refining that drawing and, and making it um, look well rendered. But it's really about um, how original that idea is, how plausible it is, um, <clears throat> how well it works in terms of functionality. Um, so, you know, and that's kind of a chore, you know, because we're we're asked to make things that don't exist and make them feel and look real. So, and on top of that, the even harder part is make them feel original and make them look original and like something you haven't seen before. So, you know, it's a lot, a lot to ask for. Um, so here, um, starting to get closer to the final pose. Um, you know, obviously I'm committing to it a little bit more. You know, I added a little light uh, to the front and a little rim light to the back. Um, I guess I should start talking about lighting at this point. Lighting, um, how I light something is this. Um, basically, I treat it like 3D. Like, in 3D, um, you can drop in a light. And when you drop in a light, 
it's coming from a specific direction. It's got kind of a, you know, um, usually it's got kind of a fall off to it where it's bright, the brightest at one spot on the object it's shining on and that, that brightness kind of falls off. Um, so what I do is I feel, you know, mentally I, I kind of drop in a light and sometimes I'll even draw that in perspective on the actual image to show myself where it's coming from. So that way I commit to a very specific direction. And I always kind of look at that and remind myself that's the direction the light is coming from. Um, and then I kind of just, you know, drop a little rim light and kind of um, uh, brighten the edges of the uh, character. So my biggest kind of principle in, when I light things is always light from um, uh, always be loyal to your light source is what I'm trying to get at. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, every, you know, form, like for example, the deltoid and the bicep and the stomach and all this stuff, um, every form should be lit almost kind of individually, um, thinking about the direction that that light is coming from. Um, so, don't kind of um, don't get too uh, frazzled by lighting something like you know how am I going to light this uh, you know just light eat it each individual part uh, on its own and then you're going to kind of see it you know form together um, so like look at the deltoid for example okay how do I light a more or less a half sphere um, with the lighting direction um, coming from where it is. Um, how do I light a cylinder, you know, say the bicep, how do I light this, that cylinder, um, coming from where that light is? And then eventually, you know, you'll get to a point where, okay, uh, things look kind of real, you know, if you know how to render, um, simple objects, and then you can start, um, um, adding and subtracting some of that light based on how close that object is um, to that light source. So if the deltoid is closest to the light um, that's hitting it, then, you know, the stomach may be br um, lit a little less brightly and then the legs will be lit a even less brightly than that. Um, so you have this kind of fall off. Um, there's a hot spot uh, up in the top shoulder region and then the light gets uh, less and less bright um, as it falls off. Um, so being very comfortable with, uh, lighting simple forms is probably, um, you know, huge, uh, in terms of rendering realistically. <clears throat> um, also, you know, you don't have to add a ton of lights when you light your character, you know. This is a, kind of a simple uh, light setup. I got a rim and I got a, um, a source light, like a key light, main light. Um, and then, you know, when, once you get like an environment in there, like maybe, you know, there's the ground. In this case, the ground's going to be, I think, I've settled on like a brown or an orange. You know, maybe get a little bit of bounce light coming up from the ground that um, interacts with his legs or his weapons. Um, <clears throat> it's really, you know, you don't want to get too complicated with your lighting. You just want to, um, have, you know, two or three lights. Um, I've had one in the past on certain characters just for the moodiness, but two or three should help to kind of show the form in the best way possible um, of the character. Um, and, you know, you can get, you know, a little moody with your lighting. I think the, the fewer lights that you have, kind of the moodier it gets because things tend to get darker quicker. Um, um, but you also kind of show less form as a result. So, you know, just, um, 
what you're trying to achieve at that point. Uh, for this demo, I'm just kind of trying to show off the character the best way possible. So I'm, I'm dropping in, I think, two or three lights. Um, I don't, I guess another thing I should mention in terms of lighting is I don't, um, you know, I don't think it's really necessary to, you know, have, uh, too many different colors in your lighting scenario, you know, it's really not about, unless I'm doing like an illustration or something that's more of like a production piece um like you know full illustration of maybe multiple characters whatever i'm not gonna have a bunch of different colored lights i'm gonna try to keep it as simple and subtle as possible um that's something i feel like i can do later if i decide to put this thing in a scene um part of Keeping things simple is, you notice here, I'm rendering in black and white. <clears throat> um, the reason why is because um, I don't want to address color yet. You know, I want to be comfortable with the idea of the character, and I want to be comfortable with the pose and light the character correctly, and I don't want to bring in too many different um Thing, too many different hurdles to, to jump over before I'm ready because I'm just going to um, overwhelm myself. So um, I already kind of have a lot on my plate at this point. I'm, I'm addressing you know multiple things at once. Um, and I tend to be also admittedly, I tend to be more of a, a tonalist versus a colorist. A tonalist is somebody uh, I was told by one of my friends, a tonalist is somebody who um, draws with tone, which is you know anything on the grayscale, um, um, and and then they add color later. A, a colorist is somebody who tends to go straight in with color, um, like impressionists or colorists. Um, um, this technique is kind of based off of uh, the the old technique. I, th I think it's called grisse. It was like an oil painting technique where they would paint in black and white, and then they do washes of color oil on top of that black and white after it was dry um, to develop a final color piece. So I'm kind of doing a grisse method technique here. Um, And I think most people I know tend to paint this way, um, just for the the simplicity of it. You know, addressing you know uh, a couple things at a time, and then kind of adding you know more once you're at a comfortable spot. So um, I have some reference up um, of some of my favorite, um, you know, bodybuilders uh, in terms of, you know, that I use for reference, um, like Ronnie Coleman or Frank Zane. <clears throat> Frank Zane was like, I think, a bodybuilder back in the 70s. But I'm looking at that. Uh, uh, that reference so that I can kind of really nail your muscles and muscle shapes um, and really push forward the idea that this guy is powerful. Um, later on, I do things like try to 
create little uh, tension lines of, of skin stretching across the forms of the muscle. I add veins. I really get um, the, the hands feeling knob, knobby and, um, and muscular. Um, and all this is kind of supposed to supplement the idea that this is a brute. This guy is powerful. He's got a lot of um, physical strength. <clears throat> and, you know, even with his expression, he's, he's not happy. He's ready to go, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to establish his, you know, a, a strong balanced pose and also like a um, give him a sense this kind of feral quality uh, as you can see with his the ridge on his back um, trying to you know do as many things as I can to supplement the idea um, that he's a brute um, Um, I spend a lot of time just detailing this guy out, um, a lot of time trying to work out the anatomy and make sure it's what I want, um, um, some great artists that I like. Um, uh, in terms of rendering style and how realistic they get are Carlos Fuente um, and Jordi Schell. Um, mentioned those guys a lot. I uh, really like their work. Uh, Carlos Fuente does uh, drawings and paintings and Photoshop. Uh, Jordi Schell does um, sculpting, like traditional sculpting. Uh, he's done it for like just about every movie you can imagine. Um, and they just have a really solid, realistic, plausible look to everything that they do. And that's why um, I kind of try to uh, walk in step with them. <clears throat> um, if you haven't taken one of George's classes, you should. Uh, it's really, really great. Even if you do you know, uh, drawings and you're not a 3d artist or yeah, and you're not a 3d artist. Um, because it's just, it, not only does it help you kind of understand form a little bit better, but you know, it, it helps you see somebody else's style, how they work, how they think. Um, here I am kind of, uh, pushing values. You know, trying to get to dropping down some really dark darks, um, making sure that, uh, you know, I would use my full value range because, you know, uh, I don't want to, I want the image to pop. I want it to feel, you know, interesting and contrasty. I don't want it to get too dull. Um, Again, dropping in some uh, highlights, pushing the value range a little bit. The highlights kind of help uh, show the form off more. Um, give it that kind of you know, roundedness. Um, give it a little bit of wetness. I think I end up knocking that wetness down a little bit, but um, I don't want it to feel like he's greasy. Um,
messing around with the uh, axe placement. Um, I think part of my issue right now is that the axes are the same, um, as well as, you know, their positioning. Um, which I want to eventually, you know, I noticed that and I want to make them more asymmetrical. Um, asymmetry is another design principle. I should get familiar with all the principles of design because I think, I don't know, there's about 10 or 15. Um, but asymmetry helps to create interest. Um, and I think it should be just like um, all the design principles, they should all be used in this, in a nice kind of balance and a nice kind of, you know, um, dance, if you will. Like, there should be some asymmetry, but then there should, should be some symmetry. There should be some areas of high contrast, some areas of low contrast, some um, areas of high detail, and some areas of low detail. And it's just a way to get the eye to move around the character. Um, for me, you know, the character um, in of itself is a composition. Um, and you have to know how to use those principles of design to keep the eye moving around the character. Um, <clears throat> um, whether or not you have created a background or an environment for it. Um, it should stand alone as its own great composition. Um, uh, another design principle I guess I can bring up is uh, rhythm. Um, rhythm is something I think is pretty important um, and even at the stage of this thing not having clothes, um, uh, using the muscles and the um, pose to create rhythm here you can kind of see that uh, uh, there's almost this, I guess this is this particular part isn't rhythm, but there's this triangular kind of uh, pose um, where his axes are coming up, um, pointing towards his head, and, and his, his kind of hump on his back is, is like the crest of that uh, triangle. Um, so that, that's a very strong pose, very strong kind of compositional element. Um, uh, and it, it helps to direct your eye towards the head. Um, the, the rhythm of like the muscles too, like where the, the lines that the muscles create and the, um, the lines on the, the side of the abdomen where he's, he's got this fat that's kind of bunching up. Um, those things kind of help you to flow across his body in, in a specific direction. Um, and, you know, I end up adjusting that more as I go to help your eye flow a little bit better, but um, that's uh, an important aspect of keeping your eye moving around. Um, also, edges are really important when you uh, create a character or a composition. Um, hard edges tend to... Um, keep the eye in specific places or attract the eye to specific places. Um, and soft edges tend to let the eye move around uh, more. Uh, so think of hard edges as a gate um, that kind of uh, traps you in specific places. And then soft edges are kind of like a, an open door that allow you to flow in and out of it. Um, both are very important. Um, there's also uh, lost edges, which is kind of like a combination of the two. Um, but generally speaking, um, <clears throat> you know, you kind of want to have, uh, I would say, I would say you primarily want to build your concept up with some soft edges and then refine um, some of the edges into hard edges um, in areas that you want the eye to kind of like um, 
stay in in terms of its interest. So maybe on the face, I'll have a few more hard edges. Uh, maybe on some of the weapons, I'll have a few more hard edges. And uh, hard edges uh, and soft edges can also be used for to create depth. So like if you have a, a leg that's behind another one, maybe that's um, maybe the leg that's in the distance is a little has some soft you know a lot of soft edges, and the leg that's in front of it that's overlapping in front of it um, will have some hard edges to show that it's in front of and it's overlapping the other leg. Um, so a lot of that stuff um, are your general design principles that I would you know always stay privy to and, and understand um, because they're all very you know. Um, all things that you're going to use no matter what type of concept you create, whether it's character or environment, they're all, they all should be created with good design. <clears throat> Here I am, I think I'm making some of the final adjustments to the uh, pose. Finally kind of figure out what exactly is going to work best for him. Trying to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time detailing the face. Um, you know, I spend a lot less time detailing things that aren't as necessary, like the feet. You know, they're number one. They're kind of in shadow, but they're also, you know, you don't want to have, you know, highly rendered feet and then the face looks, you know, like an afterthought. Um, you want to. Uh, spend a lot of time in the areas that are the most important. Um, here I'm adding a little bit of, you know, I added some darkness to the horns. That's another design element. I mean, I'm adding contrast to the areas that um, I want your eye to kind of uh, go to. Um, I think something that's fun to do um, and this is something that I kind of learned from uh, taking some of Jordi Shell's classes is, you know, messing around with the teeth. I think that, you know, whether you're creating eyes, teeth, you know, uh, hand, whatever, um, you know, really think about each element and how they work for that character. Instead of me creating, you know, um, just regular teeth, you know, maybe, I, maybe even if I referenced boar teeth specifically and I just looked at those teeth and put those exact same teeth in this thing's mouth, um, you know, think outside the box. Think about how you can make it, you know, even more wild and crazy. Um, uh, and, and maybe that'll help, you know, push this thing's kind of, uh, um, pushes interest. Um, so I, you know, you saw that I added some teeth that kind of like flared out, um, had a curve shape to them, and, and a lot of the teeth look like they're canine teeth. Like even the front teeth look like they're canine teeth. And I just want this thing to look as savage as possible. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, if you were to do, uh, a character concept of an alien or something like that. You know, think of ways to take it beyond. And then what I mean by that is <clears throat> um, instead of just giving giving an alien regular human anatomy and then plopping on like, you know, some, you know, interesting alien head, right? Think of the fingers. You know, what do the fingers look like? What does what that, con that configuration look like? Do they have three fingers? Do they have two fingers, the five fingers, the eight fingers on each hand. 
Um, and how do those fingers look? Are they long and thin, like longer and thinner than a human's fingers? Or are they short and stubby? Do they have suction cups on the end or whatever? I mean, you know, even things as simple as like a hand can be really interesting. Um, and so think of all the different ways that you can make it um, not a human, you know, because inevitably if you make something that's going to be humanoid, you end up sticking to a traditional human body. But, you know, push beyond that. Figure out how, uh, even if you have to stay within the confines of something that's humanoid, figure out what little things you can do to kind of um, alter its look so that it, it fits that uh, archetype a little bit better or that um, that idea a little bit better. <clears throat> um, you know, the last thing people want to see is another human. You know, you don't want your character to look like something from, uh, you know, Star Trek, where it's basically an alien head on top of a regular human body, you know. And I mean that nicely to all you Star Trek fans out there, but, you know, they, for whatever production budget they have or whatever it is, whatever reason they have. I mean, they don't, um, like I'm talking about the series, the TV series, you know, they're not putting a lot of like, you know, eight legged aliens in there. They're, they're using actors, putting on some makeup and then calling that another alien. So for better or worse, um, that's the, the truth of the matter. But, uh, since, you know, you're not, necessarily limited to that um, on paper come up with something new and interesting and a new take on it here I am adding his uh, nipples <laughs> even down to the nipples it matters I'm giving him you know Pigs have multiple nipples where they have like eight or ten, something like that. So I'm trying to give him, you know, um, what a, a pig-like creature would have. Um, just kind of with some dark tone, I just kind of quickly laid down some ideas um, of where, excuse me, of where I want his, um, armor to be laid out, his armor slash clothing, whatever. So trying to, you know, make it tell a story and have some culture to it and history. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to cover up too much of the anatomy because for him, his anatomy is important. It tells that he's strong, powerful, you know, and that he's a brute. <clears throat> uh, I you know, the idea that I have for his, um, for what he's wearing. Excuse me. Ugh. Um, is that, you know, he's a brute, he's barbaric, he's, um, you know, maybe he, I mean, he, so he doesn't really care about what he's wearing. So he's got a lot of leather straps and, um, bone pieces or, or horn pieces coming off of it. So he, he's not concerned about looking royal or, or prestigious. He just wants to put stuff on that helps him get his job done better. Um, very minimalistic. But um, he also, you know, he kind of collects these trophies, these horns. Um, he's got animal skin, potentially, you know, the leather that's on him. Um, I think I, you know, eventually put in some scalps dangling off of his, the front of his uh, um, loin region, if you will. Um, all to kind of show that he's, you know, um, 
kind of like this uh, gladiatorial uh, boar. Um, one thing I'll mention too is you know comparative anatomy. Be really good with how to merge different animals or humans and different animals together um, because those things kind of root things in reality and understand uh, your comparative anatomy. Um, to me, comparative anatomy is uh, is basically how things are similar and finding the similarities and capitalizing them. Capitalizing on them. Um, so, like, if you have a you know a whale fin versus a frog hand, right? How do you merge those two things together to feel like they've got a little bit of both of those characters, or I'm sorry, those animals um, in that new idea, um, but also you know feel like they're pulling from uh, anatomically um, the same kind of um, functional purpose. So, I, you know, obviously I said whale, fin, and frog hand. I'm merging two things that are already have a similar purpose um, and trying to bring them together um, despite the difference that they're two different species, to, you know, all together. Um, I'm not trying to merge a whale fin and like a frog tongue, you know, and just drawing from similar, similarly anatomical, um, anatomically, um, let me re-say that, drawing from um, similar parts of anatomy, um, uh, analogous parts, um, and trying to make those two things work together um, <clears throat> to form a new concept. So here I am on the side. I'm kind of just trying to come up with an idea where the axe has a um, maybe like a, the profile of a boar, and uh, end up tossing that, as you can see. This is uh, all me kind of trying to take some time to actually design those axes and get them to be asymmetrical, find some shape that I like. Um, I guess one thing that's worth mentioning um, at this point is materials. Um, another aspect of design which might not be as um, obvious is materials um, and specularity. Um, it's a lot less interesting to have a character that is all the same material or all the same specularity. Um, and obviously the, the way those two things relate is uh, different materials have different specularities. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, having uh, potentially, a, you know, a shinier leather on top of a, a duller skin or a, you know, shinier, in this case, the shinier horns on his belt, um, contrasting with the more matte skin. Um, he's, you know, he's going to have these metal, um, axes. So maybe those are, 
um, very shiny in comparison to other parts of his body. Uh, he's going to have little metal rings, as you can see right there, little metal rings um, that contrast nicely against the dark, or I'm sorry, the, uh, <clears throat> the dark metal rings that contrast nicely with the lighter matte skin. Um, so knowing how to render uh, materials fairly well is, is also important. At this point, I'm just kind of going in and detailing little things here and there. Um, you know, um, when you look at a character like this, I mean, maybe it's, you know, it seems like a lot to think about, um, but, you know, address each part, you know, you give each part its, its, its kind of due uh, respect, you know, um, for, you know, for example, there I was, you know, detailing out the, uh, the leather strap on the shoulder or the leather harness on the shoulder. Um, you know, that area, give it some love. I mean, people, you know, that's an area of interest. Um, give it, it's, it's due kind of, um, it's due detail, you know, um, you know people are going to be looking at that area, so spend some time on it. Make it look like leather. Maybe detail it out with those stitches. Um, uh, give the edges a little bit of trim or, you know, maybe, you know, add layering. <clears throat> um, as you saw there, the shoulder piece had another layer of leather underneath it, you know. Um, I like to do stuff like that um, for characters that have uh, clothing or armor or whatever. Layering tends to sh give it this kind of complexity um, where you have potentially different materials on top of each other, different patterns on top of each other, uh, anything, uh, different colors, you know, of different things on top of each other. Anything just to kind of, you know, make it feel like um, it, it's it's got this kind of complexity to it that uh, maybe one layer might not have. <clears throat> um, and layering is just another way of you know, adding detail, essentially. Um, I guess layering also kind of helps to show culture because it's got a, you know, a few different um, um, pieces of material um, that are you know, being used to put to, uh, together that particular part. Um, like, <clears throat> for example, here I'm adding this kind of braided look to the leather belt. Um, instead of just giving it this leather strap for a leather belt. And that's just to, you know, make it feel a little different than your, your you know, the belt we've, the leather belt we've seen before. Uh, and, and other concepts of other things, and to give it this sense of culture, like this thing maybe has some sort of intelligence, obviously it's wielding two axes. So um, why not spend a little time, you know, figuring out what uh, other parts are going to look like as well, and try to make them feel different and new. 
um, <clears throat> uh, to also help further uh, along further along the story of this character. Um, the the belt area, especially, I mean, that's another huge area of interest. Um, so you really want to kind of go to town on that and make that um, feel like um, something that's well thought out and, and well rendered. Messing around with more leather straps on this guy. Trying to do it in a way that doesn't, you know, pull too much from, um, doesn't add too much detail and then too many places. You know, you want the eye to have a chance to rest in certain spots. Um, but I still feel like there's something missing at this point. Um, it's just, you know, I think it would be cool to see an arm band on his arm. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also, I started this kind of um, horn motif, on uh, this horn leather motif on his belt. And I want to have an opportunity to repeat that somewhere else. Just to show that it's a repeating, it's kind of like a theme for him this horn and leather theme um so it doesn't look like it's just a one-off idea for the belt <clears throat> um repeating things um helps to kind of set a look a specific look for that character um as opposed to doing something like making all of his uh parts and pieces all his little um pieces of leather and clothing all feel like different from each other. Um, they might, it might look a little too um, random and, and not thought out from a design perspective. So you want to have some stuff in there that um, brings you back to the, the theme um, that you created. I'm trying to um, use a kind of like this this brush that has like this brush strokey quality to it um, just to give the the metal on the axe a little bit of um, of that brushed metal look so it looks like it was um, manufactured in a, in a specific way in a crude but specific way um, that just makes the leather, or I'm sorry, the metal on the axe look more real. Um, if I was just to put shines on it, you know, you wouldn't really be able to get the sense that that's, you know, a real metal. Um, so you want to add a, add a little bit of noise to it, um, but noise that is specific to how that thing was made. Um, I think I, you know, further along and end up beating up the metal a little bit, making it feel a little bit more hammered and crude, um, which was something I'm, I'm thinking that that's how they would have made their weapons back then in a very crude kind of um, <clears throat> blacksmith type of way where you know, they're hammering out parts of the metal. Um, <clears throat> and that, again, uh, is a design element because it's saying Look, this thing uses crude weapons. It's not using like, you know, uh, an axe from a knight or an axe from a, um, a, you know, a king or a prince. It's using a weapon that's um, 
very crude and, and, and um, what you would expect a, a barbarian type of thing, animal to, to use. Here I'm kind of using yeah, this brush I think I made a while back. Um, it's just like a cloud brush and you can make it um, with your, you can make it with an airbrush and you just kind of like drop down, you know, some random noise with an airbrush and then go back and erase it out with another airbrush and go back and forth and back and forth until you create something that looks like a cloud and then go go ahead and select that and turn that into a um, brush preset. And that usually gives me enough interest and noise for the background just to make it feel like this thing is being, you know, put into some kind of environment that's got maybe some atmospherics to it or something. On the axis, you know, I will, I'm adding a little bit of filigree, a little bit of uh, design, you know, carvings or whatever to the, to the face of the axe just to, you know, make it feel a little cultured. Um, I mean, he could have stolen those axes from his enemy. He could have, you know, killed somebody and then, you know, took his took these axes for himself where he could, you know, use them, manufacture them himself. Um, but the idea is that they come from somewhere um, and they're not just your generic axe. They're, there's some kind of um, representation of history to them. Adding a little bit of kind of stippling to the nose to make it feel textured and a little gritty. Almost as if it's, you know, like this noisy kind of skin texture. Um, I guess I should talk about photo textures. Um, I rarely use them. Um, if I do, I don't use them for this concept at all because, I you know, photo texturing is really not my thing. Um, I like to create everything I'm doing. Um, even the brushes that I make, I uh, try to you know, create all those as well. It's just, I don't know, I feel like photo texturing can be done in a way where it's, it's, it's subtle and it adds another level of realism to what you're doing. And it's, um, it's great uh, for certain things, but I think it can get pretty heavy handed pretty quickly, especially if you're you know, photo texturing whole parts of bodies to, you know, your character, which I've seen done before. And that's just like, it takes your creativity away, but also, it also, uh, you know, it's not your work anymore. And that's, that's how I feel about that type of thing. Um, you're just kind of, I feel like I end up turning into like this photo collage and not like a trained artist who can, you know, handle that. Um, and some people may be saying, well, you know, you reference photo photos as you draw. So that's, is not like a form of cheating, so to speak. You know, I don't think so because 
ever since um, artists have been alive, they've always been referencing uh, the things that are around them. Um, masters of today and yesterday have all referenced, um, you know, the human body or the landscapes that they're painting or anything. Um, and that's, that's always gone on for centuries. So it's not something I feel um, is different from my process. I just have more photos available to me. Uh, in fact, you know, if I could have a model while I'm drawing some of these characters, I would love that. I think that'd be great. Um, drawing something that you can see live in the round as opposed to um, taking from some, uh, something that's two dimensional. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, long winded way of saying I don't, don't recommend using photo textures, but I've seen people use it and do it in a successful way. And I think that especially for movies, um, that seems to be coming more and more of a pattern, um, because they, it's not that the artists don't want to draw stuff on their own. It's just that, um, photos are a fast way to do things. And, um, they also, uh, help things look more realistic. So it's that. Earlier you saw me using like a brush to kind of uh, give like a mottled texture to the skin. Um, it helps to add a little bit of noise. Here you see me using um, uh, like a lasso tool to create, to kind of select off the edges of the axes and, and create like this, this, you know, this rendering that kind of looks like um, those pieces and parts were cut in specific directions. So the blades have this kind of, um, the, the lines on the blades all go in a specific direction that you would expect them to go in, um, based on how they're manufactured. Um, the lassoing is great. The lasso tool is great for, um, <clears throat> for creating hard edges and very crisp edges and, and boundaries between things. Um, I've learned to use it, um, more, um, and try to use it sparingly, you know, <clears throat> sometimes it's a nice way to get really quick graphic shapes. Um, especially when you like do things like thumbnails. Um, where you want them, where you want to knock out thumbnails, a bunch of thumbnails really quickly. Here I'm just adding more noise, um, adding lines that kind of go across the skin. Like if you notice on the uh, bicep and deltoid, um, those lines are kind of you know, supposed to represent um, the skin stretching across the, the flexed tense muscle. Um, it just adds a little bit more detail, more interest, um, and it, and and tells you a little bit more about the form. Like there is a layer of skin that is um, wrapping across, being stretched across the uh, muscle. Here I'm adding the um, hammered look to the, uh, to the metal. And, um, you may be asking me, well, how do you create stuff like that? What technically are you doing? 
Um, a lot of what I'm doing is using the overlay layer. <clears throat> um, and sometimes I use a color dodge layer, um, which if you go to your layer blending options, you can um, change what how that layer acts and you can change it to the whole layer to an overlay layer or to you know whatever color dodge layer. Um, primarily those two things, nothing too crazy. Um, and I, I like the way overlay works because you can see what's happening underneath it. You can see the stuff that you've done underneath it. Whereas if you try to do, if you try to have a normal layer, you start to um, mess with the work that's underneath it. Like you can't see it as much because of the opacity. Um, overlay tends to work a little bit better. Uh, it mixes with the layers underneath it. Same with color dodge. Color dodge is a little bit more heavy-handed, though. I don't like to use it as much. It it tends to make like if you use white or if you use even light gray, it tends to make the colors and values underneath it get too bright too quick. Same with color uh, color burn. Except color burn is the opposite. It makes things get really dark really quick. <clears throat> Adding some vein work to the arms. Make them feel really powerful. Um, part of the reason why I like to model things, model them, M-O-T-T-L-E-D, I think is how you spell it, um, add like a noise texture to things after I've painted them, is to make them feel, to, to take them away from the very intrinsically photoshoppy look that, um, your your basic brushes tend to give, like if you use a regular round brush or a hard brush or a soft brush, doesn't matter. They all tend to make things feel very sterile and photoshoppy. Whereas if you were to look at somebody's skin texture or whatever, there's a little bit of noise and a little bit of undulation of tone there that you wouldn't get with a regular Photoshop brush. So I try to go in after I get to a comfortable state of rendering and add some noise and some interest. Um, another thing you can do to add a little bit of noise is, I think there's an actually a noise filter in Photoshop. And if you, if you do it really subtly where like maybe you um, add a slight noise to the skin and give it a little bit of graininess, um, that's done in, in um, a, a subtle way and not, not to, you know, you're not turning the whole thing into like this, um, you know, big kind of diff diffusion of noise. Um, then you can get a nice, interesting kind of skin texture, kind of grittiness. I've done that before and it works pretty well. Um, but sometimes it comes out a little too uniformly for my taste, so I like to just apply it with brushes myself and uh, um, and give it a, a little bit more randomization. Adding some weatheredness to the axis, some you know some nicks and um cuts make them feel like they're used and that they're not brand new 
Um, a lot of what I'm doing at this stage is, you know, I'm happy with the overall image, how it's laid out. Um, but, you know, I'm zooming in a little bit more. I'm going into that second and third read, and I'm trying to see, does this still hold up? Does it feel, you know, well rendered? Does it feel like it's not just a Photoshop um, painting? You know, am I, am I kind of taking it a little bit further? Um, so trying to get it to zoom in a little bit more off, you know, a little bit more, um, make sure things are working well. Um, so that when I zoom out, it looks really clean and crisp and nice, and it looks like it's packed with a lot of interest and detail. Um, so when I was mentioning third read, um, second read and third read, here's how it goes in terms of design. Um, first read is like silhouette. You know, that's, that's probably the most important read. How does that silhouette look and how does it feel with that character and does it, does it supplement the idea behind that character. In this case, the silhouette is this big lurching, um, you know, hunched over uh, body um, with, you know, big bulking muscles. So that kind of works well with the brute archetype. Um, second read is, um, I used to kind of like to categorize it with tonal layout, like how things are placed on its body um, <clears throat> um, and the different tones uh, that help break it up. In this case, it's the lighter skin tone with the darker leather uh, straps and pieces. And um, um, the second read is it's a uh, you know, big belt. Um, it's big, dark mane. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, I guess the axes would maybe be more part of its first read. Um, and then the third read are the uh, finer details, like, you know, skin texture, um, uh, metal texture, leather texture, uh, you know, teeth, eyes, um, all that stuff. Here I'm um, adding um, stripes, and the reason why is because uh, I just want to add more interest to the upper body, and also want to make him feel a little bit more feral. And I think that um, stripes help to do that, um, and that he's, it's not as expected. You know, you don't necessarily expect to see stripes on a boar or a warthog or, you know, something of that nature. Um, so it kind of gives it a little bit more flair, um, a little bit of my own taste to it. Here I'm even adding, you know, added a little bit of spit and drool to his mouth. Kind of, uh, the spit and drool is just to kind of, you know, accentuate the fact that he's in a, a yelling um, expression and he's pissed off, you know. So a very unhappy boar, unhappy to see you. Or maybe he's very happy to see you because it means he gets to eat tonight. I don't know. <clears throat>
here I'm just kind of um, tweaking parts of the belt because I noticed that they don't fall on his midline like his midline is kind of like the crease in his um, abdomen and I want those things to all kind of line up all of their midlines to line up with that the midline of his stomach so I try to move them around so that they kind of feel like they're on the center of his stomach more more than they were Um, basically what I did is I felt like the face was a little too bright too early. What I mean is that it was so high key, so bright that it, there was no place for me to go in terms of adding highlights or more, more of a roundedness to the forms. Um, the fact that it was so kind of bright and overexposed gave me less values to work with so I turned the, the darkness down um, added a little bit of darkness to the face and started carving out some highlights erasing out some highlights so that so sort of, they felt like um, there was more value there which would in turn give you more form trying to make his face feel a little bit more um, dramatic um, by darkening, adding some dark circles around the eyes, popping the eye, which helps to pop out the eyes themselves out more, um, making the kind of bony protrusions that are coming off of the face, darkening those, um, giving his face more of this like this uh, primal look where things fade to black, you know, like the nose, the fr you can see like the front of his nose starts to become more and more black. Um, adding some nice, it just adds some nice contrasting elements there as well. So what I'm doing here is adding some wrinkles, adding, you know, trying to build up the forms on the face a little bit more, you know, darkening some areas to get like some of those um, parts of the forehead and eyes and cheeks and wrinkles on the face to all round out a little bit more. Even adding some veins, you know, to get some tension in his face, anger.
think soon I'm going to be getting into some color because I'm happy with um, how things are laid out, how they're lit. Um, the level of detail um, should probably mention that that image that you just saw is my was my desktop image um, it's done by an artist by the name of Jane Radstrom I believe um, I like to have um, different, you know, um, inspirational images on my desktop. Um, so, you know, I don't like usually putting up my own work because I want to do something new and different and I want to be inspired by somebody else's interesting technique that I haven't quite grasped yet. So I want to kind of is my way of staying fresh by looking at different things and and uh, you know everybody has something interesting to offer whether or not they do exactly what I do Um, so I'm just, you know, spending a lot of time detailing, um, <clears throat> um, um, it's just more of the same, just really kind of trying to get, um, as much interest and detail uh, in this as I can before, you know, without going too far, but before I get to the color stage, I want to really feel comfortable about taking this thing to color. Um, so here I'm kind of, I decided to add like this leather, this almost like inverted lamb skin, skin underneath the uh, belt, you know, get the, add some layers and also to kind of, you know, think about like, hey, what if I was wearing this belt? Would, wouldn't that be uncomfortable? Yeah, so maybe there should be some kind of skin between the skin and the belt. You like that? Hey, what if I was wearing the belt? Oh, I get it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, it just helps, you know, think about stuff like that um, and helps it feel more real, you know, when you kind of get into what if it was actually being worn, like would would that person be uncomfortable with it, would, would, would parts of it make them uncomfortable, what would they do to kind of fix that uh, so it fit better with their body? Or worked better um, and believe it or not it sounds goofy but it, you know it's like when these things for example have to animate like if you know that leather strap if I'm if this guy needs to be able to lift his arm up above his head I need to be able to tell the animator well it works because blah 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 like it works because there's um, an opening between the, str the strap and its neck, so there's some breathing room there. Um, these 
little um, circular links that go, these metal links that go underneath its armpit um, won't stretch, but the leather itself might stretch a little bit. Um, so being able to kind of, in your own head, work out the mechanics of how this thing would work and, and what would be movable and what wouldn't um, are definitely important. And they definitely do come into play when you're taking this thing into a final game or um, into a final movie. So here we are, finally, color. Um, yes. Um, so basically, here's how I approach color. <clears throat> I drop down a main color, which I like to call um, the mother color. Um, and think of it like this. In order to keep your image from looking cartoony, you have to have unification um, to your colors. And the way you do that is by having, for example, here I'm using a mother color, I think as an overlay layer or a colorized layer, one of the two. Um, and you put that down. Um, and then all the other colors that you layer on top of it w should mix with that color um, so that, and the way they mix is by you not putting full pen pressure down when you paint that color uh, over the other color. Um, it's just like oil painting when you think about it, because oil painting, the way you get um, unified colors is by mixing from another color. So you, you, like if you use a red or if you use a blue or if you use a green, they all are unified by mixing a little bit with the main color. Um, and here, the way they're mixing is by opacity. So like if I throw down my color and I put other um, layers of color on top of that, I'm not pressing down with full uh, pen pressure, I'm kind of pressing down maybe 50%, you know, strength or whatever, um, and letting the other color underneath it kind of show through a little bit and, and quote unquote mix with that color. Um, mixing and oil painting has to do with concentrations. Um, and here, uh, it has to do with opacity. So, you know, not putting full pen pressure. And that way you can see your colors and your color underneath. Um, and sometimes I'll even drop down a color pretty heavy handedly and then kind of erase it back a little bit so I can see the color underneath as is what I'm kind of doing with this leather as I drop it down. Then I start to erase it back a little bit and, you know, immediately it starts to unify with the color underneath it. Um, initially my mother color is like a greenish. And right now I'm changing it to something that looks a little less sickly. Trying to, as I do that, I'm trying to figure out what the color scheme is going to be. Like if I make this background brown, what am I going to make him? Um, because everybody kind of expects to see an animal, like a mammal like this, brownish. And kind of decide to make him a little cooler. Uh, than the brown tone, um, just to set him off a little bit from the background so he doesn't blend too much with it. And also, like, the coolness of his uh, skin color or fur or whatever is going to be, um, is going to, not only is it going to contrast with the background, but it's going to contrast with the brownish leather pieces that are on, t you know, that he's wearing. So it'll create a nice kind of back and forth with uh, color temperature. Here I'm, I'm dropping down um, some warmer tones for the areas where capillaries uh, on the body would kind of uh, collect. So you get, you know, on the elbows, fingers, knees, um, mouth, nose, around the eyes, nipples, all that stuff, ears. Eventually I put some on the ears. Um, those are places where capillaries collect and that, what that does is that adds, um, 
an opportunity for color uh, shifting or hue shifting. Uh, so that way it's not mono uh, monochromatic throughout the whole character, kind of moves around. And that's something you want to be very aware of is how do I keep a color from getting flat? And a flat color is basically a monochromatic color across a, a surface. So <clears throat> here um, I'm using some of the placement of the capillaries on, on, a, on a, your average mammal or human. I'm kind of using that as an opportunity for color shift. Um, I'm also like, sometimes what I do is I drop down a color and then I desaturate parts of it here and there. And that that shift of saturation and desaturation will help give me a little bit of a hue shift, kind of a subtle one, but uh, a hue shift nonetheless. And um, other things you can do are, um, yeah, just dab little bits of random colors in certain places and kind of erase them back so that they're very subtle. Here I'm uh, adding uh, the a really bright warm tone to the eyes so that they kind of pop from the cooler um, the cooler dark areas around them um, comparatively speaking when you compare the eyes to the areas around them. here I'm trying to add this kind of subsurface effect subsurface scattering effect to the nose um, where like the light that's hitting it is actually bouncing around in the skin of the nose and creating this kind of luminous um, translucent translucent ish kind of nose um, same thing with the ears I end up doing that with the ears uh, I think even the fingers Um, something I don't, I don't think I mentioned in the lecture um, that I had when I was out there at the Evolve event was color, um, what's it called? Color vibration. Um, color vibration is another way to keep interest in hue shifts in an area. Uh, the theory is that you go back and forth, uh, you, you keep er interest in an area, uh, you, or you bring interest to certain areas by um, vibrating two complementary colors together. Uh, in other words, you're, you're putting them right next to each other, or you're scattering them around right next to each other, um, maybe in a kind of modeled impressionistic way. And what that does is that quote unquote vibration of those two colors next to each other creates interest <clears throat> um, because of the contrast that they have with each other. There's an, because of their, their opposite colors um, that creates interest. And so um, in this case, if I wanted, you know, him to kind of look more interesting than this this creature look more interesting than his background i would vibrate his skin a little bit more so I'd vibrate that blue maybe model in a little bit of orange very kind of desaturated orange um and that would make his skin a little bit more interesting and it would add some interesting kind of hue shifts um and, and i'm that's not to say that now he's going to be this blue orange looking thing but you add the orange in a way where it's very desaturated, very subtle, um, but yet you can see it. And, 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 and the, from far away, the viewer can't really tell what's happening, but they see that the color is not flat and it, it is, in fact, more interesting and has more color to it than the, a flatter background would have. So here I'm kind of trying to add um, some bounce light from the um, ground. And if, 
that light would make some of the darker areas that are in shadow, it would kind of illuminate them a little bit with the color from the ground. And the ground is uh, brown-ish. Got a, a warmish light coming down, bouncing up, bringing that light up into the under parts of the body. Helps to add a little bit of atmosphere as well. Um, and that atmosphere creates a little bit of depth so you can see that the front part of his body feels a little bit more forward than the back part of his body, like where his his lats are and his uh, the sides of his stomach. Those feel like they're receding because of the, the kind of foggy atmosphere created there. <clears throat> This is just more detail, more detail. <coughs> um, trying to, uh, you know, help recede some of those things that are, don't that don't need to be as contrasty, like some parts of the uh, leather on the arms, um, so that they, they don't take away too much from the belt and the face area. I'm trying to knock those back a little bit with some atmosphere. And when I create atmosphere, I kind of just make a you know, more or less like a, get like an airbrush and kind of paint like this translucent kind of foggy brown over things so that they feel like they're, you know, receding into that kind of brown background a little bit. I think um, one thing to, you know to think about when you're doing this, you know, part of when I when I color something is I'm trying to just like when I render something in Photoshop, I am trying to get away from making things look photoshoppy and I don't want them to look like they're painted all with you know your average brush I want them to feel more real than that <clears throat> so same thing when I color I'm thinking about how can I make this not feel like it was just colorized because you know a lot of work that's done in Photoshop tends to feel like it was done um, with the cover colorized layer and overlay layer and I'm, the way I fight against that is by you know, having a lot of interesting hue shifts, um, um, painting, not painting colors flatly, um, you know, which also is hand in hand with hue shifts, um, getting some, you know, some textural interest in there, um, which I guess is more rendering uh, related, um, but always I guess for color, it's just really getting that color to feel organic and, and I always feel like it's moving um, from one color to the next. <clears throat> um, and that's how you kind of 
for me, that's how I've kind of learned to fake being, um, <laughs> I want to say fake being good at color, but you know, I kind of understand color theory. I just don't think that I'm, um, I'm not confident enough to say that I'm like a colorist or I'm somebody who can paint well, just straight up with color. I think you have to be really solid in your traditional, um, oil painting skills to do that, which is something I'm trying to do now. Actually, I'm trying to learn how to oil paint, um, better so that I can be good with color. And that's just something I, I mean, maybe one day I can feel confident enough to just start painting straight up with color. I won't have to use these hacky Photoshop techniques. <laughs> uh, even on the axe, you can see the axe is not just like a gray, you know, the, there's like some c cools, there's some warms. Um, one thing I learned with oil painting, it's kind of like a, a, a one of the main principles of oil painting is that, you know, how you paint with color is you always compare it to the colors that are right next to it. You know, so something is, isn't a cool color. It's just cool relative to the color that you're putting it next to. Um, so, and there's all these kind of like, you know, like if I was to select, you know, his skin color, pick his skin, it actually might look warm, um, in a vacuum you know, so to speak, but here it looks cool compared to the warmer tones around it. So you have to always be thinking about, um, relative color and not just what you think that color is. <clears throat> that will give you a more kind of sophisticated understanding of color. Here I um, was opening another file. I was trying to find out what layer had my blood on it. And uh, I wanted to add blood to the axis. So here's what I'm doing. Here's how I'm doing it. Uh, I already had the blood down as a selection. Um, just dropping down some, you know, I think I'm using like an overlay layer with some like, I'm not using like a bright red, which is what you might, you know, typically think or what you might just typically pick for, for a color, but I'm using kind of like a desaturated, darker crimson-y color. So it feels like a real blood, like a blood that's maybe, you know, drying or, or has dried. Um, you know, and also adding some streaks, you know, individual streaks to it. So it looks like, you know, he's cut through something or potentially, you know, blood is spattered up as he's, hit something. There I added a little bit of color to the, the, you know, the areas that were a little too black. Uh, I'm not doing something stylized where things just, it's okay for things to fall to black. I, um, um, tend to like to add a little color. This is the final piece. Um, and, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you guys learned something.